Okay, so we can start. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, and everyone welcome to this uh, quite interesting uh, webinar that's going to address the one of the biggest challenges that came through due to the COVID-19 pandemic, either in terms of the healthcare support systems, in terms of the e-commerce, work from home, and also in terms of uh, losing the steam on the single-use plastics movement that was created just before the COVID. So we are going to today listen to the distinguished speakers that how they see this uh, one of the biggest challenges from the COVID-19, that's the plastic pollution, and what solutions do we have? So I would like to uh, thank all the distinguished speakers and the participants. And for the questions, uh, can you please type your questions in? So at the end of uh, all the presentations, we will have very interactive Q&A session. So please uh, stay tuned, mute your mics and videos, and enjoy the presentations and put your questions in the chat box, and then we will have interactive discussions at the end of the presentation. So first of all, let me further view, invite my colleague, Kakuko Nagatani Yoshida. She is the coordinator for the West Chemicals and Air Pollution in United Nations Environment Program for Regional Office for Asia Pacific, as well as the project manager for Countermeyers Project that's to combat the plastic pollution in the marine environment. And okay. So, Kakuko, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mushtaq. Uh, good morning, good morning, yeah, afternoon, and good evening to even some of you who are uh, connecting from the very different time zone from ours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mushtaq, for the um, introduction. Um, my name is Kakuko. And uh, I'm very honored to give you this uh, opening remark, uh, how I see uh, this issue of COVID and the waste management and plastic pollution. I think some of you uh, have seen this interesting study that was published uh, less than a month ago. Uh, by uh, the institution think tank called Lowy Institute based in Sydney, Australia. This COVID performance index uh, compare uh, almost uh, 100 countries around the world, looking at the confirmed cases of uh, uh, COVID in each country, also number of deaths uh, per million people, and also look at the size of countries, uh, political systems, so and so forth, to see ranking which country seems to be performing better in this collective fight against uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But as a worker of United Nations Environment Program, which is the UN program that provide authoritative uh, voice and advocate for global environment, I am left to wonder, you know, why we are very concerned and prioritize fight against COVID. What are we doing with uh, the fight against much longer pandemic emergencies such as waste management and plastic pollution that we have had with us for a long time. And I'm constantly reminded of this fight that we have because uh, whenever we see a site like this in the uh, neighborhood of where I live in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, a disposal face mask stuck in a hole that's supposed to drain the, the street uh, water. And the case of flooding, you know, this is very important function of the street drainage. But now, or the hole uh, uh, filled with the disposal facial mask. Now, COVID-19 itself is a pandemic emergency 
for some of us was, has been another reminder that we have other planetary crises. During the COVID, that we have seen tremendous increase in the consumption of single use product. And some of them because consideration is now for the hygiene and the convenience. Convenience always exists, but now we have hygiene related concern that will encourage us to use and, and require us in many cases to use more product of a single use nature. And many of them, if it's not all, are made of plastic content. Now, last year, uh, as part of the, the fight against COVID, has requested that at least 40% increase in the disposal PPE production. Now, if global population stick to a standard of let's say one disposal face max per day, then by the time that lockdowns are ending and people can go out to, to, to the street and re resume some of the normal activity, the pandemic could result in a monthly global consumption waste of 129 billion face masks and 65 billion hand gloves. And it's not only those, the hygiene product that would, uh, or, or safety product that will increase, that we have seen already the global plastic packaging market is uh, booming and projected to grow by a new uh, growth rate of 5.5%. Now that's uh, a very, very impressive figure when we have major downtown and uh, other sectors, productive sectors, manufacturing sector. Now, itself, this increase in the use of single use plastic is not itself, it should not be problem. But it become problem because we know in Asia Pacific, now today we are talking about South Asian countries, the disposal practice of use item, particularly uh, uh, plastics, waste, are really down to two things. One, open dumping and open burning of waste. Now, when this happened, we have another crisis, which is the, the pollution related to waste and air pollution. Now, as an uh, advocate of uh, the global planetary health, when we talk about the, the pandemic and the plastic pollution, we cannot only talk about people's impact on the people population. We also concerned about the plastic population's impact on the ecosystem and species. Even before the COVID began, we knew that we have a planetary crisis of marine plastic pollution, which has increased 10 times since uh, 1980s. And much of that um, the, the marine debris we find in the ocean today up to 80% are plastic in nature, just because plastic is so durable, lightweight, and so abundant in our modern society. And when we talk about the impact on species, for example, the freshwater fauna and the migratory species, we still know very little. So based on the work we have done, uh, ourselves, UNEP, and also our partners, I would like to um, convey three things that I feel it's very important if we are ever one day win this planetary crisis of plastic pollution. One, we have to know more about how plastic is becoming pollution. As I said earlier, not all the plastic will be, uh, have to become pollution then it's not possible for us to eliminate all the plastic from our society because plastic do provide a lot of uh, benefit, uh, including the hygiene benefits and also the protection, but also environmentally because it's durable and lightweight, it can provide some environmental benefit. However, if we are to coexist sustainably with plastic, we have to know how 
plastic is becoming pollution. And we need more knowledge for that. The based in the South Asian countries, every cities, every country, we need to know more about then how the plastic leakage is happening in that particular location, who are involved, how much, what kind of products, so that the policies and action will be ba uh, created based on that knowledge. And definitely the partnership with citizens, government, academia, enterprise, and financial institution in key sectors, such as food and beverage, textile, and health sector have to be increased. And those actions have to be prioritized as we provide a prioritized fight against COVID if we are to beat plastic pollution. Now, this week, we conclude the United Nations Environmental Global Assembly uh, in Nairobi, and also it was uh, uh, virtually done. So the, the more than 150 country representative connected to that global assembly. So in one of the, the um, uh, reports that was launched during the UNEA, uh, there is this report called uh, Making Peace with Nature. In that report, it says, the COVID-19 crisis provides impetus to accelerate transformative change. I want to believe this. I want to see this COVID crisis as opportunity to fight and win other crises that we know that existed for a long time, such as plastic pollution. It's all up to us to ensure that investment we are making, the effort we are making to fight the plastic, uh, fight the COVID-19 is also helping us to win the pandemic called plastic pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kakuko, for very insightful and especially a lot to see that uh, how partners can connect with uh, UNEP, uh, the work you are doing uh, in UNEP. So now let's move to the our next presentation. And that's where we are going to look on the, the in South Asia. As this work, webinar is more focused for South Asia related plastic pollution in the wake of the COVID-19. To capture that picture, we have uh, requested Mr. Amit Jain to enlighten us on those flows. So Amit, uh, Amit Jain comes from IRG. He's a director, uh, IRG Systems, South Asia, and based in Delhi. So Amit, floor is yours, please. Uh, can you unmute, please, Amit? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, now you are audible. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. And good to see some of my colleagues from my alma mater, Asian Institute of Technology, UNEP, and others. Today, uh, we are going to discuss a very important subject of plastic pollution and how COVID-19 has really, really impacted considering different plastic use, different plastic uh, products, and what is the status in South Asia? I take the lead from Akuko, who has rightly pointed out about partnerships, who has rightly pointed out about so many issues which are uh, plaguing our region. First of all, uh, I would like to discuss about us, a simple slide, and what is COVID-19 and what it means for waste management. What has been the policy responses in terms of uh, waste management in the region? What are the impacts? Some of the impacts you have already uh, heard from Kakuko. What are the key gaps and challenges? And what are the sustainable choices? I feel that it is also an opportunity. Everybody says that, uh, well, pandemic has disturbed us. Yes, it's a kind of a reboot. When we try to reboot ourselves 
our systems and our economy and our lives. So many reboot in every aspect. Can you, uh, I, I can't move the page. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. We are from a consulting company. We started operations in 2001. We have provided technical assistance and we have providing technical assistance to a number of uh, clients. Well, when we talk about the region, we see that South Asian region is a major consumer of so many things. We are a po population hub. In terms of population, our population is growing. And with respect to that, our urbanization as well as economic growth prior to COVID-19 was very high. So demography, economic growth, and purchasing power of the uh, population is driving the consumption. And as a result of which, plastic consumption is also growing. So when we talk about the COVID situation, we find that there are inefficiencies in the waste management system. And when we talk about the waste management system, it's the waste which we get it from our consumption. And this kind of waste, we find it in our solid waste management as well as in the medical waste management. When we try to look at some of the statistics, we see that, that uh, the percentage which has increased in terms of the weight or percentage which has increased in terms of the uh, waste generation which is coming to the uh, treatment facilities ranges from five to 10%. However, the type of waste generation or the variety of products which are coming in the waste streams, they are as a result of which we are seeing more infectious waste as well as uh, different types of solid waste management uh, is required for that. We also see that there is a dominance of the face mask and the gloves in the waste stream as a result of which there is a risk of trauma, risk of infection, risk of uh, chemical risk, risk of uh, sharp needles, sharp mills, as well as there, there is a risk from the hazard of the healthcare treatment methods. Because in South Asia, we find that the treatment, you cannot cover each and every region of the geography of the South Asian region. When we try to look at the COVID waste, we find the dominance of the face mask as well as dominance of the gloves. We see that in whole of Asia, South Asia ranks second in terms of the masks, disposal of the masks. We also find that the waste which is coming from the uh, solid waste as well as which is coming the, from the uh, medical waste in terms of face mask has increased. We also see that uh, there is a tendency to use one face mask uh, per person in the region, as a result of which the face mask, uh, every day it's being disposed. How it is disposed, where it is disposed is a major question mark. We also see that some of the uh, uh, policy responses of different countries address both the situations, that is policy responses related to medical waste as well as policy response is related to municipal solid waste, but they are not uniform across the whole region. We also see that we have regulations in South waste, solid waste management. We have a uh, ban and restrictions on plastic bags as well as single use plastics. We have market-based instruments. We have different instruments related to uh, collection as well as uh, treatment. We have many interventions, but how effective they are during the situation. When we try to uh, map the plastic value chain in a geographical context, we see that uh, inefficiencies start after consumption. We see that 
in majority of the South Asian cities, the carrier is air, as was pointed out earlier. Uh, carrier is water. Different medium are, uh, are carriers to different types of waste. We also see due to the uh, solid waste, inefficiency in the solid waste management, you see different types of uh, uh, waste in the drains, as well as in the, on the roads, as well as on the land. This is a common sight in uh, South Asian region. You see different drains and you see at the barriers, you find different barriers uh, in the drain, you find different types of waste and how we uh, should address this situation. When we look at the geography of our region, we see that there are two major uh, river systems, the Ganges as well as the Indus. And you see the coastline where we are having uh, uh, the plastics or different type <coughs> of uh, uh, components of plastics which are found in the region. When we see this journey, we see that on land plastic pollution leads to marine litter. You see the different coastline of different countries and you can very well imagine that these coastlines, they become the major, uh, uh, major you can say uh, the place from where the, it gets into the sea, uh, uh, plastic waste gets into the sea. This is a, one of the favorite slides I always present in such type of uh, uh, presentation. When we try to visualize, we see from source to sink. This is the journey of the plastic and along with it, COVID waste is also coming. The problem is when the COVID waste gets mixed with the uh, domestic waste and it gets again uh, uh, leaked into the carrier, it, it uh, it has the potential danger of uh, uh, polluting our seas. Some of the studies have pointed out that uh, there is a chance that if the COVID waste is coming through that sewer system, then uh, it can infect the population. This is a general uh, uh, general uh, representation of the plastic pollution in the region. And therefore we can see impact on our terrestrial ecosystem, impacts on our aquatic and marine ecosystem. There are health impacts, there are impacts to the climate change. And last but not the least, there are social economic impacts. We see that though COVID-19 and plastic pollution impacts the water, air, soil, every aspect of terrestrial and marine ecosystem, and also the socioeconomic uh, uh, aspects. There are opportunities it provides. We should look from a uh, uh, point of view, from the point of view of opportunities, what we can do in such situation. Can it accelerate our compliance? It uh, help to design economic instruments in our geography, technology to those countries where there is lack of technology or what could be the solution? Do we have the knowledge base data information related to the uh, baseline? And what could be the voluntary measures which can adopt? How can we change the behavior of the people? So, we have sustainable options. Do we need to redefine our regulatory system in the, from the new perspective? Certainly, yes, because we have a pandemic situation. This situation can come in our future. So we need to devise our own system, our own mechanism by learning from what have been done earlier. Can we tweak those uh, interventions. And here are some of the interventions which were, uh, which were uh, used earlier. Considering the risk to human health, financial instruments will evolve to sustain the plastic value chain under EPI mechanism. We find that risk to human health is one of the major drivers. 
And when we see this risk, everybody gets ready to pay something. Earlier, payment for pollution or payment was payment for any uh, using by using any instrument was considered to be uh, constrained. Not. So we can use this system, this opportunity, to define our own system and use it to, uh, for the uh, con considering the different measures. We can use it as an opportunity for fighting the pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Amit Jain, for very insightful understanding of uh, what's not yet there, means uh, in terms of waste management from different aspects, including policies, technologies, social behaviors. So now we are moving to the more specific sectors. And first sector always comes with the packaging and plastic pollution to mine is a food. If you look on the food, whether it be delivery, whether it be packaging and so on, the huge plastics and packaging is involved. To get this insight, we have requested Mr. Ganesh uh, Koliga, Assistant Vice President for the Government Affairs and Pol uh, Public Policy in Sergi, India. So Mr. Ganesh uh, Koliga, floor is yours, please. Thank you, everyone. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, whichever geography you're in. I will uh, just, you know, uh, start my presentation. Is my uh, presentation visible? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, UNEP. Thank you, AIT, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here. And then I would like to share my perspective on how plastic and plastic packaging waste uh, impacted uh, or, you know, was affected by online food delivery during COVID-19. So I'll just take a little bit of uh, a step back uh, to tell you what happened during COVID-19 because this was a very unique and an unprecedented situation in the life of everyone in the past, maybe a hundred years. So uh, COVID-19 uh, and then the severe lockdown in India affected basically movement, access to daily essentials, food, and it impacted logistics severely. We had a severe lockdown for nearly about three months. And uh, during this time, e-commerce was the only source of essentials to the citizens. Uh, because we were not allowed to move around, you know, we had no access to outside uh, to any of the, you know, things that would require. So during this time, specifically the uh, food tech aggregators worked with the government in enabling supply of daily essentials and groceries to the citizens. So which was a very important uh, initiative so that the lives were not impacted. And, and also, you know, another uh, critical, uh, you know, economic activity was working with the neighborhood grocers and other major grocery stores and supermarket in supplying groceries and essentials to the citizens through the platform. So also coming to the sector specifically, restaurants were closed effectively for three months for delivery of food. So only when the phased unlock happened, food was allowed to be delivered to customers. So, uh, and, and for furthermore, no uh, dining in was allowed and only delivering of food was allowed. So. What, what did the uh, food tech aggregators do, you know, uh, to adapt to these changes? So if you recall that in by and large around uh, after the plastic waste management rules came in, in 2016, and in India, in about, uh, by about 2018, we had uh, uh, the banning of the use of single use plastics. So, this call to stop the usage of single-use plastic came from the highest authority of the country. So what happened was in a, a very uh, robust manner uh, because of the enforcement and then you know a, a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, the authorities actually uh, taking a st quite a stringent uh, action. Manufacture and availability of single-use plastic materials like shopping bags, plastic cutlery, you know, when it was enforced, it came down drastically and whatever was residual there was only available. And over a period of time, we saw that, you know, SUP materials by and large was not available. Of course, you cannot say, is it 100% eliminated? Not really. It's still there, but compared to the previous proliferation of the single-use plastic, it's much, much less now. So uh, what did the food tech aggregators like Swiggy do? 
we issued advisory to the restaurants on the platform to adopt sustainable packaging like paper bags, food grade plastic containers for packaging and delivery of food. Uh, you can have a you could have a question here that should we have used food grade plastic containers? The uh, currently for maintaining the taste, uh, the quality, and the ambient temperature, food grade plastic containers which are above 50 microns, as is allowed in the plastic waste management rules of 2016 is the current available alternative for packaging and delivery of food. The other single use plastic materials have been eliminated uh, to a significant, significant level. And uh, we, uh, the usage of, uh, uh, you know, aluminum foil and then the brown paper, bar, you know, cover for, you know, a delivery of food has taken place. In fact, if people who are in India, you can see that if I order food, this is what I get. And so I don't get, you know, any single use plastic, no plastic cutlery is being given out. Uh, what has happened is these changes have made a good solid and a, a you know, a definite move towards eliminating single use plastic packaging. And, and, and also this is uh, helped in the path towards sustainable packaging and uh, reduction of plastic waste from you know from the uh, being produced from the food delivery so the other advantage of food grade containers is it is recyclable and then uh, india has got a very uh, unique system where the families clean these food containers and they use it for storage so you have quite a bit of percentage of reusage happening and since it's recyclable so and uh, india having a very robust recycling you know, ecosystem, it gets picked up. Of course, you know, there are certain, uh, uh, what do you call that lacunae in terms of who is the user has to basically clean these food containers before he disposes of. That way the intrinsic value of the plastic containers that's used for food packaging, you know, is maintained and it gets picked up in the waste recycling stream. So uh, I'd, I'd come to, uh, you know, the next is uh, how, you know, uh, uh, the plastic waste rules, uh, uh, you know, which was uh, issued in 2016, how it helped in, 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 in actually bringing some semblance of or uh, focus for sustainable, you know, metals being used for packaging. So as you're aware that uh, PWM or the plastic waste management rules was uh, notified in 2016. As per the rules, you know, plastic packaging of 50 microns and above was allowed so that this could facilitate collection and recycling of plastic. This was a significant, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, an element which helped in eliminating the single use plastics which are below uh, 50 microns. So, and as you are aware that India has a very robust recycling ecosystem, both in the formal and informal systems. So uh, we have a proliferation of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that, right from waste pickers to itinerant waste buyers to which who pick up these waste and then it goes into these streams, the formal and informal streams for recycling. So uh, since uh, food tech space uh, restaurants on the platforms are classified as waste generators, so the, uh, the packaging of the food is by the restaurant partner. And this is where an advisory from the platforms in terms of adopting sustainable packaging material and then working with them in terms of how they can access, you know, how the packaging uh, has to conform to the rules uh, that is actually uh, issued by the government. So here, you know, there's a lot of actually uh, engagement with the, uh, the restaurant partners in terms of uh, keeping them aware about their obligations uh, towards elimination of single use plastics and then using food grade containers which can be recycled. So the, coupled with this, you know, the governments uh, uh, and the various state, because uh, environment is also a concurrent subject in India where the, the respective state pollution control boards, you know, enforce and then the urban, uh, uh, you know, local bodies and the pollution control boards enforce these rules. So the robust monitoring and enforcement system have ensured that restaurants use food grade plastic containers, I mean, uh, aluminum foil and brown paper for packaging. Uh, again, I would reiterate, is this, you know, has the system become better? Yes. Is it perfect? Not yet. We are actually, uh, I, the discipline that we, I see, you know, I come from the e-commerce sector, 
And then I see compared to four or five years ago to now, is there's a huge change in that. And as we go towards, you know, uh, when sustainable containers of sustainable packaging is uh, developed uh, in a mass scale, I'm sure, you know, uh, this effort will get better. Uh, and, and I would say that it's uh, along with the platforms and the restaurant partners, the individual stakeholders, the, the consumers also have to realize that they have to do their bit in terms of uh, participating in this whole uh, initiative to reduce and then uh, plastic consumption and then uh, use it prudently, you know, and then help in reuse of the same and recycling of the same. This is a very important responsibility. So the all the stakeholders in the, the whole uh, chain, uh, the value chain have to cooperate with each other. And I'm sure, you know, having been, uh, having gone through an unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic, uh, you know, uh, COVID has taught us a lot of things in terms of how to conserve things, how to use it prudently. I'm sure this will also reflect in the way that we use plastic. Uh, also, you know, there was one point, you know, because uh, the whole, uh, uh, economy was uh, completely brought to a standstill. To a large extent, manufacturing also had had actually uh, got suspended, and which also brought in uh, uh, you know the element of the uh, non-availability of packaging material. This also helped people to reuse the bags, etc. So there was some sort of what you uh, call that uh, changes in lifestyle and changes in usage patterns, etc. So. My understanding is that single-use plastic, when I go to markets or when I go to superstore or when I go to shop, I see very less of them. Of course, as a consumer who orders from e-commerce and food tech aggregators, I also see there is a drastic reduction of the same. So uh, what we are looking forward to is the EPR framework that's being discussed when that comes out. So there'll be that much more compliance that would be uh, onerous on the uh, platforms, the e-commerce platforms, uh, when I'm talking from our sector. So this will also help uh, in a large way to uh, towards a sustainable path in terms of plastic waste management. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ganesh uh, Kolegal, especially on this uh, aspect of food delivery and plastic, which remains uh, like uh, challenging for most of the countries in the world. So now let's uh, uh, have a journey from India to Sri Lanka and also move from the food to the healthcare waste. So let me invite uh, uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Inoka Suravira. She's a technical head of environmental and occupational health unit at the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka. So Dr. Inoka, floor is yours, please. Are you unmuted, Dr. Enoka? Uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Enoka. Yes, and uh, can you see the slides as well? Yes, please. Right. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, again, a uh, very good morning and a good afternoon to uh, uh, some of you all. And uh, uh, I would like to thank especially uh, UNEP as well as uh, 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 the ATE, especially uh, Professor Vishu, for, for giving me this opportunity to present this important uh, aspect. Uh, I think today I have to talk about plastic waste management in the healthcare sector during COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka. Well, I am supposed to talk about success stories, issues, and concerns. When it comes to this COVID pandemic, we know that plastic waste, especially in the healthcare sector, has grown uh, to larger numbers. We need to understand why that has happened. 
if we just uh, look at in different uh, perspectives, uh, when it comes to the healthcare staff, there has been increased usage of personal protective equipment by curative health staff that is at hospital level. Additionally, when it comes to contact tracing and the field level activities, even this personal protective equipment usage by the public health staff, especially Sri Lanka has a very good public health uh, infrastructure with all uh, medical officers of health and the ground level staff, the public health inspectors. So even they are using a lot of uh, uh, personal protective equipment than before. Again, increased generation due to increasing COVID patients. So that again is a factor for this plastic waste growth in healthcare sector. On the other hand, increased use of personal protective equipment by uh, visitors. So even now, uh, as, uh, of course, uh, the, the functions of the hospitals uh, are uh, happening. So therefore, even the visitors, uh, previously they were not wearing the mask and all, but now, of course, they wear these things. So there is an increase due to that as well. On the other hand, increased generation due to testing, because a lot of testing is happening at healthcare institutional level as well as field level. So due to that also, there is increased generation. Increased generation due to dead COVID patients, like you know, the plastics which are being maybe the bags and things. So, you know, we need to consider that as well. And certainly in time to come increased generation due to COVID-19 vaccinations. So we see that there is plastic waste growth in the health sector during this COVID pandemic. Well, if I'm uh, to explain the management options currently being advised to practice, we need to understand if, if we just uh, think about the Sri Lankan situation, we have dedicated COVID-19 healthcare centers as well as the other hospitals. So many hospitals starting from the national hospital that is the highest level teaching hospitals, uh, provincial general, government uh, district general. So we have around uh, 650 healthcare institutions. And on the other hand, of course, the primary healthcare units uh, and uh, so if we just count those, uh, it is like, you know, thousand plus and also the MOH clinic, so private hospitals. Well, so many healthcare institutions. Now these are functioning. So of course they are generating plastic healthcare waste. In addition to that, of course, we have the dedicated COVID-19 centers. When it comes to the government healthcare institution, there is, we have given uh, policy guidelines and then uh, instructions as to how to manage healthcare waste. Anyway, plastic waste is also coming under healthcare waste. Well, first, the regulations are such that they need to avoid these things as much as possible. When I'm describing about the success stories, I will describe how certain hospitals have taken initiatives to do that, basically uh, practicing this uh, uh, R, 3R or 5R or 7R, those systems. So the avoidance of avoidance is what we have instructed. On the other hand, of course, the hierarchy goes on, uh, recycling, uh, so that is the current practice. But in addition to that, of course, now uh, uh, if, you, if there is contamination, then of course there are two options, either to go for incineration and uh, there is this uh, hybrid autoclaves in Sri Lanka, the metamizers, so they can use those things. That is the usual guidance that we have given. And on the other hand, when it comes to dedicated COVID-19 centers, where most of these things are not possible. So again, we have given two options for them, incineration and using metamizers to dispose of such waste, including plastic waste. 
because there is an issue, the segregation, those things are not very much possible at these COVID dedicated centers. When it comes to incineration, we have very clearly advised them to use good condition incinerators, uh, like, you know, at least because we know the plastics, the issues, uh, generation of uh, unwanted and the carcinogenic and other uh, toxic gases, dioxins, furan. So just to identify good incinerators in the sense like uh, uh, which can reach uh, up to even 1,100 uh, centigrade or so. So that is the, the guidance that we have given uh, for the dedicated COVID-19 uh, center. So that is the usual practice that is happening in Sri Lanka. If I'm just to explain some of the success stories, some of the hospitals, they have environmental health policies and they are practicing this avoidance. For example, they don't allow patients or the visitors really to bring uh, plastic material. In Sri Lanka, it's very famous, these plastic bags and especially these plastic lunch sheets where they wrap up uh, food and all. So therefore the hospital administration, they have taken decisions not to allow these plastic bags and plastic, uh, these lunch packets to come into the hospitals. So what they have done is actually they have gone a step forward and with the help of uh, maybe the donors, local donors, they have introduced this bag. So certain hospitals, they have taken this initiative and they have introduced this bag. When, patient, when visitors come to the entrance, they will give this bag so that they uh, uh, put whatever the things that need to be taken into the hospitals and they will take to the wards. Therefore, they are not allowed to bring shopping bags, the plastic bags into the hospital. So some of the hospitals actually, they are doing this very well. On the other hand, at hospital level, there is segregation happening at the place of generation. We have issued from the national uh, level, Ministry of Health, we have issued guidelines. The segregation has to happen at the source of or the place of generation. Even there are hospitals where they do secondary segregation also. After that, of course, they practice recycling. And just to show you, According to the healthcare waste guidelines in Sri Lanka, we have this national color code. The healthcare settings, they need to segregate waste, healthcare waste as per this national color code. So plastics and polythenes, they are being given a particular color, orange color. So they need to, at source, of course, they need to segregate this and then uh, 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 collect the waste like this. Of course, most of the hospitals, uh, they have these uh, stores where they need to, after the segregation happens at the source uh, or, or the place of segregation, they need to uh, store these things. And then this is a picture of uh, uh, such a store in one of the uh, healthcare settings. And as I mentioned, there are hospitals where they engage in secondary segregation as well. So these are some of the photographs which I have taken from them just to show you that this is happening to this. But I have to um, say something. Now, this is not happening at every healthcare institution. Well, even during the COVID pandemic, we did capacity building by because we just wanted the health staff to be motivated to do the healthcare waste, especially this plastic waste, the segregation, those things. So even from the national level in the Ministry of Health, where I come from, I come from the Environmental and Occupational Health Directorate. So we are the national level focal point who's responsible for healthcare waste management, just to do the policies, the, the, to do the uh, planning and then the programs. 
So we have done capacity building programs just to show you even amidst COVID with all these uh, precautions, we have done that. And actually this has uh, helped the people to develop attitudes and then may be a reminder to further engage in uh, waste management. Uh, monitoring and reviewing at hospital level happens, especially when uh, there are uh, microbiologists, they have the waste team. So they engage in these waste audits, reviewing, monitoring everything. And in addition to that, from the national level, Ministry of Health, we also do this monitoring. Well, when it comes to issues, collection in remote areas, that is a, an issue. We don't have facilities to the extent that we want. And of course, increasing amounts of plastic waste, that again is an issue. Because since what we have done is now not all healthcare facilities have an incinerator or a metamizer. We don't recommend having so many incinerators. So uh, anyway, metamizer, of course, now it's uh, basically a hybrid autoclave. So what we do is we do clustering. But due to the increase amount, sometimes this has become a problem even segregation issues, because when it comes to COVID pandemic, of course, now most of the hospitals are very busy. So we have had segregation issues, operational issues due to COVID-19 at healthcare settings. So all these actually uh, can be considered as issues. Well, when it comes to concerns, now uh, we need to understand uh, COVID-19 is a big health problem. We all are fighting. But uh, on top of that, there are environmental as well as social impacts due to even plastic waste uh, being mismanaged. As the previous speakers mentioned, we can't ignore air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution. We have to understand the importance of having proper mechanisms to control this at country level, regional level, and maybe at an international level. And we need to understand the comprehensive nature of all these environmental risks if plastic waste is not properly managed. Not only our pollution, All these things will again aggravate, and these things will re-emerging diseases. So we need to understand that it is going to be a vicious cycle. This management burning, we are adding a lot of pollutants to the air. Again, that is going to uh, affect human health. So these are my concerns, and I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Enoka uh, Sarivera, for insightful for the Sri Lanka's healthcare waste management in the perspective of uh, plastics. Now let's move to the look into the more broader way that how the healthcare waste management during the COVID-19 pandemic is being observed from the trends and what are the challenges, recommendations for the policy and the practice. For that, uh, we would like to request uh, Mr. Terence uh, Thompson. He's a consultant in environment for environment and health. So Mr. Thompson, floor is yours, please. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, actually, I'm located in the United States right now, so it's uh, 2.53 in the morning. And for that reason, I have recorded my presentation. So I think the Secretariat, uh, hold on, I'll just put this in presentation mode. Wuhan, China. Greetings to all of the participants. I would like to thank AIT and UNEP for this opportunity to speak with you all about healthcare waste management during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, let's start our uh, 
uh, talk in Wuhan. I'll just put this in presentation mode. Wuhan, China was, of course, the first city to experience a massive outbreak of COVID-19. A 1,000 bed hospital shown in the slide was constructed in record time, along with numerous shelter hospitals and quarantine facilities, all of which had to be supplied with massive amounts of PPE, medical equipment, much of it being plastic, as well as packaged food, medicine, and water, and a lot of plastic packaging material. Now, healthcare waste typically contains quite a lot of non-hazardous material, which is potentially recyclable, but it also contains infectious agents, sharps, chemical waste, and may even contain radioactive waste. So unless healthcare waste is safely managed, it poses risks to patients, healthcare workers themselves, visitors, and the wider community. What was the experience in Wuhan? Well, the daily production of healthcare waste in Wuhan increased more than sixfold during the first few months of the pandemic. The authorities in Wuhan did successfully manage the situation with strategic use of stationary and mobile disposal units, co-processing of healthcare waste with municipal solid waste, and temporary licensing of waste haulers to transport healthcare waste safely to neighboring cities for processing and disposal. What about elsewhere? What has been the experience in other locations during the pandemic? Actually, very little public data are available on healthcare waste during the pandemic in other locations outside of Wuhan. A few publications cite this table, which was published by ADB in May of last year. And these figures are sometimes cited as a observed trends, uh, but that's not accurate. These are not trends, but are projected increases as estimated by ADB at an early stage of the pandemic. This slide shows some data which I've been able to gather from various sources. The figures in the tables vary widely, and the reasons for such variations are not yet explained. WHO foresees a comprehensive report on healthcare waste during the pandemic sometime next year, 2022. But WHO does not have a good handle on this issue as yet. Now let's do a reality check because we often hear that 85% of healthcare waste is non-hazardous, but is that always true? This slide shows the findings of a waste characterization study in a general hospital in Vientiane. In principle, 73% of this hospital's waste should be non-hazardous, but because of poor waste segregation practices at source, the non-hazardous portion actually drops to only 50%. And that situation happens quite frequently in many healthcare facilities throughout the region. The mixing of hazardous and non-hazardous waste at source creates an obstacle to recycling of plastic and other materials in healthcare waste. So how much plastic can be found in healthcare waste? Well, a waste audit of five hospitals in Philippines and Indonesia by the NGO Healthcare Without Harm in 2019 found that 40 to 70% of hospitals waste was plastic. That was pre-pandemic. Nowadays, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Additional plastics would be added to the waste stream, including test kits, supplies, and other medical equipment, as well as additional plastic packaging material. Wherever there is poor segregation of hazardous waste from general waste, the result will be that large quantities of plastic are mixed with hazardous waste, and this creates an obstacle to recycling. The photos in this slide are from one hospital in Nepal that overcomes uh, that challenge. Beer Hospital provides a model of successful recycling of plastic healthcare waste in a resource limited setting. This is based on shredding and autoclave treatment and sale of sterilized plastic waste to recyclers. That sale covers about 40% of the cost of the hospital's healthcare waste management activities. Healthcare Without Harm is one organization that promotes the circular economy concept to address plastics in healthcare waste. 
This diagram is from one of their publications. Uh, one of several challenges to the circular economy approach is, of course, the cost of recycling plastics. Uh, there is hope that new technologies may drive down that cost, uh, those costs in the future. But meanwhile, the three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle remain useful strategies to address plastics in either the linear or the circular approach. Now, what does WHO have to say about the topic of healthcare waste management? The publication shown here, commonly known as the Blue Book, contains WHO's authoritative international guidance on safe management of healthcare waste. It covers both routine operations as well as emergency situations, and the guidance is applicable to healthcare facilities at all levels of development, including resource limited setting. WHO has also issued a guidance note specifically addressing water sanitation, hygiene, and waste in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. In short, WHO advises that waste from COVID-19 facilities is no different than waste from other healthcare facilities. There is no evidence that handling healthcare waste has resulted in transmission of COVID-19 virus anywhere. COVID-19 affected hospitals and communities do need to rapidly scale up their waste management capacity, but additional measures beyond WHO's standard guidelines uh, are not effective. Uh, not indicated. So in other words, follow the blue book. Now, among the many challenges that could be mentioned, I would like to highlight only a few. Uh, firstly, many healthcare facilities lack data on healthcare waste quantities and characteristics, and this presents difficulty for planning and management. Secondly, there is indeed, in many instances, insufficient capacity for healthcare waste management in the entire waste management chain, not only for treatment and disposal, but starting with collection and labeling, storage and transport of waste. A uh, third point is that poor healthcare waste management practices were pre-existing in many locations before the pandemic. So this means that all the problems arising from the pandemic are superimposed on top of systems that were already functioning poorly. And the lack of infrastructure is not the only challenge. Uh, in many cases, healthcare waste policy and regulation is lacking or poorly enforced, and human resources are often in need of strengthening. In my own experience, I've seen in the field quite a number of incinerators and autoclaves that were installed during the avian influenza or swine flu pandemics, or to support immunization programs and many have become inoperable due to poor operations, practices, and poor maintenance. I do sincerely hope that the lessons of those fa failures have been learned. Because in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a serious need to put in place systems to ensure sustainable operation of facilities over the long term. And that need is fundamental, regardless of which types of technologies are employed. Many recommendations could be made to improve the management of plastics in healthcare waste. I would mention only a few, and these are mainly aimed at hospitals. Firstly, start with plastic audits in order to understand the quantities and characteristics of plastics in the hospital, their uses, how they're disposed, and what may be the options to reduce, reuse, and recycle plastics. Secondly, strictly implement waste segregation at source because mixing plastics with hazardous materials greatly increases waste management costs and limits opportunities for recycling. Uh, next, review the hospital's procurement policies and practices and advocate with manufacturers and suppliers for alternatives to plastic and for environmentally sustainable packaging materials. And finally, in order to stay up to date with developments and to have access to relevant tools and information, consider joining healthcare plastic recycling networks, such as the Healthcare Plastic Recycling Council or Healthcare Without Harms Green Hospitals Program. Before closing, I would just like to thank 
many colleagues who shared information with me to prepare this presentation. Their names are shown here in the slide. Uh, thanks to everyone for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, for a very uh, detailed and insightful presentation to also know that how the healthcare waste management got impacted and uh, improved during the COVID-19. So now uh, let's move to, I would say last but not the least, uh, uh, everyone's uh, beloved Professor uh, Chetiapan Vishwanathan, which is also known as Professor Vishu, uh, synonymous to the AIT, to all the alumni. So without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Vishu to enlighten us on the e-commerce and plastic uh, packaging. Professor Vishu, floor is yours. e-commerce related plastic packaging. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure for the next 10 minutes to make a short presentation on COVID-19 and e-commerce related plastic packaging uh, issues. Uh, my presentation consists uh, the glimpse of my presentation is presented in these slides. It consists of uh, five different components. Let me start the first one, a short introduction on what is e-commerce, which is an exchange of goods and services between buyers and sellers through an electronic medium, primarily using uh, internet. There are four different types of e-commerce, if possible. One we call business to business, business to consumer, and consumers to business, and consumer to the consumer. The issue here is the internet has redefined the way we do business during the last one decade. Uh, so if you look at it in the last two, three years, here you can see the global sales uh, on e-commerce, it's quite interesting between 2019 and 2020 and 21, and there's a steep increases. And is there is a, any relationship with this steep increase and COVID-19 is one of the discussion points I like to raise. It's also as important related to that, how much plastic waste we have created, what is its significance? That is my essence of my discussion. And I'm supposed to focus specifically the South Asian countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. And unfortunately, we have a very limited data available. Whatever the secondary information we have, I'm trying to present this, and also trying to bring, did COVID-19 awaken the e-commerce business on this region? Now, when you talk about e-commerce in Southeast Asia, uh, it is inevitable compared to China or United Kingdom where we have 15% uh, growth, whereas in uh, India and in Bangladesh on this part in South Asia, the e-commerce is not that big factor. Okay. And one of the reasons is, is there are three challenges here. There's a challenges related to logistics, digital regulation and connectivity. Of course, in the last few years, this infrastructure changes have been changing uh, significantly. And that has led to a major place of e-commerce, uh, especially in India, Amazon, Flipkart, and et cetera. This is in Pakistan, and et cetera. So there are many new players are coming up in e-commerce in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are catching up. Okay. Now let me move to the second component. Uh, it's also it's very interesting to look at it. Uh, the changes in landscape and e-commerce during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what it used to be in the past, e-commerce is used for essentially for non-essential products. But today, the last one year we have seen, essential items such as food, groceries, health, wellness products, and et cetera, have been purchased through online products. Okay, so that's very important to understand. COVID uh, has changed offline to online for many of the essential products. 
Now, the second part of it, when you look at it here, uh, the e-commerce in India during the COVID period, okay, uh, it is, it's very important to understand that e-commerce in India in 2020, is somewhere around $33 billion, okay? So it's, uh, uh, despite of the COVID-19 breakdown, e-commerce sales in India has estimated to rise by only as between seven to eight percent in 2020. Uh, but it's interesting to know there are new segments are coming up, especially in this year. We can see more of online grocery, e-pharmacy, social commerce, and etc. Okay. Uh, now, when you look at the second part, uh, the facts and quotes and some related to COVID-19. So look at it, COVID-19 uh, led to an acceleration of digital consumption as users tried to try new digital service for the first time. And it's also it's important to see more than one in three digital service consumers started using this service only during this COVID-19 period. Okay. It's also it's interesting to see what the business leaders are saying. Uh, one of the leaders uh, Mr. Rajendra Balrama has stated, e-commerce through the pandemic has exploded across the globe and in many ways it has condensed multiple layer of growth into one. Okay. So simple question one need to ask, did COVID-19 awaken the e-commerce? Okay, now let me move to the third segment. Uh, when you talk about e-commerce and plastic packaging, you can see the variety of different types of plastic products that are used in packaging of e-commerce products. What is its significance? How much we have generated? How we are managing? Are we trying to curtail this one in the region? It's a very important thing to understand. To understand this, let's look at it, the e-commerce, okay? The issues of the e-commerce and packaging. So you, here you can see a small lithium battery. If you buy it directly on the supermarket, you can collect it directly here. But if you buy through an e-commerce, you need so much of volume and the packaging consists of plastic. Okay, so the volume could be almost 54 times of the product. Okay, it's a huge amount of plastic waste generated. One of the reasons is the supply chain is very long, so you need to have proper packaging. So now the question is we are asking another example. You can see to buy a two pieces of eye shades of 1.4 grams each, you can see the amount of plastic packaging you're using. This. Is it sustainable? And this is one question we need to ask. But not everything is bad for the years, especially in the last two, three years. Uh, the pressure with plastic packaging, and we are moving out on alternative sustainable solutions. I just want to give you one example. So here you can see the bubble wraps, which is used for packaging. She's been replaced by alternative and sustainable products. These type of alternative products have been coming up, and it's quite attracting uh, changes are taking place. Now, as part of here, the e-commerce waste, so you can see that uh, only in 2019 in India, 56.8 million kilogram of plastic, uh, sorry, waste, plastic waste been generated only through e-commerce sectors. So it's very interesting uh, statistical data. So you can see, uh, now things have put on pressure on e-commerce industries. They are looking at alternative solutions. Say, for example, in India, with the government law on banning of single-use plastic, uh, the e-commerce, uh, let's say uh, um, Amazon, etc. they looked into the alternative solutions. One example I can show you here, let's say 60% of Amazon pantry service or food service today are delivered in totes, so it's very important, which enables removing secondary uh, packaging, which essentially consists of plastics. Okay, So here you can see, the e-commerce sector is accepting the fact that plastic waste is an issue. They're looking at it alternative things. And it's also very important here to look at it. In the past, okay, the, it is very important when it comes to the packaging, there's a shift in packaging is taking place. Okay, uh, It's not only for the safety of the product. Okay, In the past, the packaging is done so the safety the product could reach uh, from the industry to the consumer or a business to the consumer. But today, it's not sufficient only the safety because of the COVID, the hygiene of the consumer is very important. So the definition of packaging in the e-commerce has changed and the hygiene is taking 
as a very important role in, in addition to what we call a safety issue. So how it will link is it's very important to understand that. Things are taking on a positive direction. Let me move to the last part uh, on the segment four. Uh, there are industries which are looking to that very carefully. Uh, here you can see uh, Amazon has come up with a different types of packaging. The traditional standard packaging for a pen is something like this. Today we have frustration free packaging so that you can just flip open uh, which is very easy, smaller size of packaging materials. So the industries are moving uh, to this positive direction. These are some of the positive news. Let me sort of finish off my presentation with some few important key takeaways. E-commerce was on the rise before COVID. Okay. And we saw, or we still seeing a dramatic spike because of the COVID and this trend is expected to stay even during the post pandemic era, it's very important. E-commerce packaging is a very important aspect of both e-commerce supply chain, as well as environmental sustainability. And that will play a very, very important role. The new hygiene concern and the consumer safety, okay, will be a major part in packaging of sustainable and post pandemic year. So what we have today, a packaging for safety will be moved to the packaging for safety and hygiene issue. And the last one is, is e-commerce in Southeast, South Asia is, in, is, is increasing. It can learn from the experience a bit from the other regions, how we could reduce the e-commerce package. And with this note, I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Vishu. So now, uh, as we have uh, only a, a quite a limited time, uh, hardly 15 minutes towards end, so we have a Q&A session. So my one suggestion is that uh, I will request all the presenters to take the two minutes max and choose the questions they want to reply now, but then they can also reply all the questions uh, through the web link provided and all the presentations will be available, made available through this web link as well. And then at the end, I will make an announcement and uh, also the request uh, that uh, towards end. But before starting this uh, two minute session with each presenter for the questions they can choose, I want to add uh, two requests to them. One is also that they can add one liner to the participants that the message they want to convey to the participants in line with the how to achieve or manage the COVID-19 related plastic pollution waste. And number two, also to see that building back better, that when COVID-19 is getting over or will be hopefully over soon, how we are getting back to the normal systems, what would change and whether we will pick up the same steam of the plastic uh, pollution management or single use uh, plastic bans and so on, or we still continue with the e-commerce or the food uh, deliveries and so on. So we have to look on that, that how the strategies can help to build back better and also one liner. But with this, uh, I would like to request all the presenters. So we again go with the same uh, like a uh, in the line, so because maybe some of the our distinguished speakers are taking a little bit of rest, so now we are back with the full energy. So first of all, let me request Kakuko Nagatani Yoshida-san for her two minutes comments or the inputs, please. Kakuko, you are there? Yes, I'm here. Um, so the, my understanding is that uh, I am to use my two minutes to give uh, some short message to the audience and also uh, comment on building back better. Uh, my key message is that one, as we all heard through the presentations today, that the problem we are seeing today of plastic pollution it's not only because of COVID. Yes, COVID got made things worse, but we are in a situation that we are in because we have not been dealing with the program that exists already, the waste management and uh, exponential production and use of material when we don't know how to, we haven't really planned for its uh, sound management. 
And the problem is no longer the technology or even the investment of financial resources or even capacity. I see that they are now even in a small cities. Um, there are opportunity. There are people who have learned how to do the environmental management of different products, including medical waste. And also investors are there willing to invest. Resources are available. We just need to channel them to solve the problem. So for the audience, I would like to request in every place that where you are geographically located or sector, there are ways to improve um, the waste management and avoid the plastic pollution. So let us all engage in its own sector and uh, the position and level so that we do not need to live with this pandemic. When there are other pandemics that were, it's very difficult to avoid, but let us deal with the one that we know how to, to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, Kakuko. So let's uh, then move to Mr. Amit Jen. Amit, floor is yours, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I feel, I feel that uh, uh, the change must start uh, at uh, personal level as well as at the, which means that we are a part of the household level. And since we are the consumer, so uh, we should change our behavior in such a way that uh, the waste segregation gets promoted. And this will go a long way in terms of uh, segregating the plastic waste at the source itself. And uh, it can lead to further streamlining of the, our collection, transportation, as the uh, waste management system. This is fundamental. Yes, and we should leave, not leave this to the uh, urban local body or any other body. So the change must start at the personal level. And uh, since we, the pandemic has taught us how to deal with the situation, and uh, we can do it. And we, it requires just a little effort. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. So let's now move to Mr. Ganesh uh, Kolegal. Uh, sir, floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. My message is that, you know, uh, I would just take, uh, you know, the leave out of what Amit said. Uh, it, the whole education should start at a very engaged, like one of the, uh, you know, participants has put in the uh, chat box, where, you know, the, the, the mantra or the three R's, the reduce, recycle, uh, reuse and recycle should be imbibed personally, you know, eliminate usage of single use plastics as these have very less you know uh, value in terms of uh, uh, being you know taken further in the reuse or the recycling uh, uh, you know channel uh, and then you know be responsible in terms of segregation and then when you segregate before you segregate you know remove all the greasy material etc if it's a food container clean it so that the intrinsic value of the recyclable is retained and thirdly you know uh, as a responsible citizen you know, use, uh, you know, uh, less plastic. Like if I go to uh, sh shopping, you know, uh, for shopping, I take my own bag. And then, you know, when I come back and then uh, whatever materials I have, I have to discard, discard it responsibly. And then the same thing, you know, if we inculcate in the family with our children in schools about how to be, uh, you know, responsible citizen, how to be environmentally responsible. This will go a long way in elimination uh, of uh, plastic waste or the indiscriminate you know, discarding of the uh, plastic waste. Thank you. Thank you. So now let me request uh, Dr. Inoka uh, Sarivera, uh, please. Ma'am, uh, you are- yeah. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much again for the opportunity. I think uh, we need to consider this uh, plastic waste is a problem, but as uh, far as the healthcare institutions are concerned, we need to strengthen the healthcare waste management systems because plastic waste is uh, one part of this healthcare waste management uh, program. Uh, I think it's very important. Maybe we'll have to use different uh, 
tactics like uh, we will have to make the healthcare administrators uh, for them to understand that doing this is important like you know giving them uh, this carrot concept and also we need to have this tambourine where everybody else is also on the same page they need to be aware as to how to do these things especially these new concepts and uh, uh, all the awareness and again maybe we'll have to use in certain places the stick that is the rules and regulations and maybe the law well it is very important for them to have this strengthened healthcare waste management system so that they address plastic waste also efficiently in such a uh, program on the other hand i think it's very important for everyone to understand the comprehensive nature because in my experience most people they would like to think of all these problems in silos plastic waste management healthcare waste management climate change air pollution no i think we need to understand the comprehensive nature and to see and make the other people understand the interconnectedness of all these things so there is action at individual level there is action at healthcare institutional level and also there is action at uh, uh, national level as well as international level well i think it's important again to promote this health uh, green and healthy hospital concept in fact we are going to do that in sri lanka uh, with all that i guess we will have better management of plastics as well as healthcare waste in healthcare settings thank you thank you uh, ma'am so let me now request to mr uh, terence uh, thompson please uh, mr thompson uh thank you very much uh i'd like to address one of the questions that a participant put to me uh Yeah, firstly, I, I agree completely with everything that uh, Dr. Inoka has said. And one of the participants asked, how do we involve the health sector uh, more in addressing plastic pollution? Uh, coming from my background as a former WHO official, you know, I like to focus on that, on the health sector. Uh, and what I would say is that plastic pol pollution is an intersectoral issue and one which involves many players. Uh, not only in government, but also in commerce and in industry and in the community. So addressing this problem effectively will will require collaboration among uh, many partners. Uh, WHO's global strategy on health, environment and climate change envisions that health authorities may strengthen their capacity precisely in this regard. Uh, that is to promote intersectoral cooperation that addresses social and environmental determinants of health. Now, in order to be successful advocates for intersectoral cooperation, health authorities will need to marshal convincing evidence on the health impacts of plastic pollution. And they will need to be able to offer practical and cost effective solutions. Uh, but unfortunately, in many instances, environmental health units have insufficient capacity to do that. Now, I have worked with Dr. Inoka in Sri Lanka and I'm aware of the good work uh, that the Occupational Environmental Health uh, Unit in Sri Lanka's Ministry of Health is doing, but we do not find you know, that level of uh, commitment and capacity everywhere, I can assure you. Uh, and that is true whether we are talking about health ministries or healthcare facilities. Uh, very often the environmental health of, uh, unit is often one of the weakest and least regarded units within an organization. So that would be an important step uh, to strengthen the technical capacity of environmental health units at every level and to strengthen their role in policy development, in planning and in programming. And then another part of this is that the health sector can lead by example. Uh, and you know, this is what Dr. Inoka and I talked about in our respective presentations. 
hospitals and other healthcare facilities can make a good start by conducting plastic audits, eliminating single-use plastics, uh, seeking alternatives to plastic products, uh, and managing plastic waste responsibly in hospitals and healthcare facilities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now, uh, beside me is uh, none other than Professor Vishu. So, sir, floor is yours. Thank you, Chad. Let me start with answering one of the questions asked related to me, related to EPR and e-commerce. Uh, please understand, uh, loss of e-commerce plastic packaging is mainly due to lack of ownership, collections, and possible recovery of e-commerce companies. So that means uh, we need to do some sort of an brand auditing, what type of companies, how much plastics they're generating. And EPR, to a large extent, extended producer responsibility has to be taken into consideration progressively to solve this problem. Uh, at the moment, many of the multinational uh, e-commerce companies are uh, taken this into consideration. They are already uh, doing certain positive things. Uh, however, uh, due to COVID, as I present in my presentation, we have a mushrooming of small and medium scale uh, e-commerce companies. Then how do you incorporate the concept of extended producers responsibility? Uh, it could be a little bit difficulty. And we need to develop some incentive system for this. So if do that, to do that, we need to have a look at it. E-commerce has to look a little bit on uh, the concept of circular economy. Uh, to finish this one, mere voluntary measures will not be sufficient. So it's important, uh, sort of a stringent policy solutions to be needed to develop. And that has to be linked certainly with EPR. And that also has to link with sustainable solutions and incorporating some form of circular economy. Now, let me finish with one one-liner statement. Uh, I strongly feel e-commerce is growing. COVID-19 is just accelerated the process. So that means eventually we will have more and more waste and specifically plastic waste. We need to accept this reality and we need to work on towards a solution. And I think the solutions will be geared towards sustainable approach and the circular economy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, having Professor Vishu beside me, just one question from my side, that uh, as we uh, are talking about building back better and as campus is opening, so like AIT is uh, now getting back into the business and the students are coming uh, here. So I would like to ask Professor Vishu if he can create sort of an incentive mechanism for his students for sustainable lifestyles to connect to the plastics and to understand that and also to adopt to that. So what incentive and what, how they can connect to the plastics? Yeah, uh, as part of our professional master's program on marine plastic abatement program, and right now we are on the campus, we have around 100 students coming from different parts of Asia. And we do have a quite a lot of incentive activities, uh, segregation of plastic, um, et cetera. But uh, we are not given, honestly, enough financial incentives. But I think we are trying to first incalculate the concepts how it has to be taken right in the beginning. Okay, so it's more of that type of thing. Thank you. So now uh, we are towards the end and our uh, next webinar uh, will be on 2nd April, though focusing on Southeast Asia this time, but uh, we will be bringing additional experts who have a more of a global view, so apply to every region. But uh, my request to all the participants, and also we will post that for the future participants, that if you would like to share your like views, your good practices, your presentations, we will create a web link where all will be posted. And so everyone can learn from each other. So I would really encourage all you, whether you are coming from NGOs, academia, private sector, government, or even as an individual, if you would like to share any videos of your own, your presentations or your thoughts, please share through this web link and we will encourage you, then we may have a little bit of discussion on 2nd April as well on that. 
So with that note, uh, please continue with uh, all our efforts to abet uh, plastic pollution in one way or other and stay safe during this uh, pandemic. And we will see you each other on 2nd April. Thank you very much.